All right, today for this one, obviously we're learning how to train for snowmobiling and motocross. So I'm not an expert on this topic. I've ridden snowmobiles probably 10 times just because I grew up in North Dakota, but I've never really went super hard on snowmobiles um, or motocross. So I'm gonna need a little help from you guys. Uh, if you have anything particular, like this muscle gets really fatigued or this, I really seem to struggle with this, make sure you let me know so I can address those uh, as I go over um, how to train. So this is kind of just a training physiology wise. This isn't a training for technique or anything like that because I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to like technique for riding motocross. So I'm going to try to explain this as if you were competing and training for an event. Although if you're just training to try to um, stay healthy overall for snowmobiling or motocross, uh, this will still work. You can just adjust some things a little bit to meet your needs. So we're going to train for the highest level here in terms of physiology and uh, go from there. So make sure uh, you ask any questions if you need and then I'll get to those when I can. Okay, let's start off with a macro view of what your training is going to look like. So when I talk about a macro view or periodization, this is the phases of training that you would go through. If you're going to peak for like a a season of racing or maybe you're just peaking for like the summer for a season of riding or for the winter right if you're snowmobiling so we have a chart here and down here is time and then over on this side I didn't really leave enough room but we're gonna call this intensity and then we're gonna call this volume and so when, let's just say you're starting from ground zero, you haven't been training at all. Summer's coming up and you're trying to ride your motorcycle. So, or your dirt bike or whatever. So when you're starting out training, you need to keep volume low because you're not used to training very much yet. And so throughout, over time, you wanna increase your volume. And then let's say you start getting into championship or com competition season, you need to bring that volume back down. And the reason why you wanna bring that volume back down is because you are gonna need some intensity in your training. And so when I say volume, this is maybe the amount of lifts you do, uh, the amount of cardio you do, just overall time spent training. With intensity, this is how hard you're working. So your intensity needs to stay fairly low right away as you build your base up. And then as you get into that comp competition and championship season, your intensity needs to spike, kind of like that. So. I'm gonna explain more what I mean here. Let's break this up into some other periods. So let's say, let's call this off season. Off season right there. So during off season, you wanna have a good base to train from. And so I would, if it was me, I would focus on kind of hypertrophy training. Um, and I'm gonna break all these down. So this is building your muscle mass. So uh, you are developing a strong muscular um, skeletal system, right? You're also improving your bone density, well, during all these phases, but you can be doing a lot of that during this. And that just means lots of lifting, quite a few reps, uh, pretty decent weight. Um, and I'll make some workouts for that in a second. Once you get, let's say, into your competition phase here where you're doing a lot of volume and your intensity is starting to ramp up, this is where you wanna move and let's call this competition. This is where you wanna move into more of a strength phase. And strength means that you are gonna be training yourself to move the maximum amount of weight possible. Because when you're thinking about riding motocross or a snowmobile or whatever, any type of motorsport, you need to be able to manipulate a hard or a heavy metal object, right? And so you want to have your maximal strength and you want to start developing that after you have a good base phasing because this training can be quite intense. And then uh, when you are getting ready for this maybe championship season or, you know, we'll just call this peak. So your peak riding time of year, you're going to want to prior prioritize power training. And power training, well, power is strength times speed and I don't mean speed as in how fast you can run I mean speed as in how quickly your muscles can react so box jumps do a really good at training this any explosive movements are going to be training that speed element 
combine that with a max strength, and then you are going to be able to uh, maximally manipulate you know, your bike or your snowmobile or whatever you're doing. So this is mostly focusing on strength training because that is the primary need uh, with motocross. Although before I start breaking these down, I do want to touch on endurance. I had a student, uh, he used to race motocross and he was getting heart rate data. Let me know in the chat if you guys have ever um, measured your heart rate during like a motocross event. But his heart rate was up at like 180 during almost the entire event. So don't completely neglect endurance training. Uh, what I would do for endurance training is I would think about doing some HIIT training, high intensity interval training, because that's gonna maximize your fitness and you don't have to do as much of it. And if you're doing high intensity, high intensity interval training, just for generally staying healthy, uh, the ACSM guidelines are three times a week for 25 minutes. So you could do something like this, that's high intensity, and you can even work this into some of these workouts like I'll kind of explain, but you just don't wanna neglect your endurance because your heart rate is gonna be working quite hard when you're doing these events. Even though you're not running and you might not feel it, uh, it's still working really hard. Let me check out the chat here. Um, okay, uh, good question. Uh, let me think about that arm pump and then I'll get back to that. Uh, the question was how um, do you know how to reduce arm pump when you're riding? So I'm going to get to that um, in a second here when I think about it. And I've never done moto or snowmobiling before. If I want to ride just for fun, how long period of time? Uh, what should you work on if you are not sore after the first time riding? Oh, so you are not sore. All right, great questions. I'm going to kind of address those in a little bit here. So this endurance aspect, you need to have some base level of fitness. And I would be working on that all season. Uh, in base season, you know, slowly ramp it up and then in peak and competition, you're gonna to wanna to maintain it, but it's not your primary source of training. So let's look at this hypertrophy phase right here. So this phase is all about preparing your body to lift heavy and to uh, be explosive and or to train explosively. And so general hypertrophy training, if we bring it down here, if you're trying to maximize and this is muscle size. You don't necessarily need to maximize muscle size, but if you're trying to get ready for this strength phase, I, I generally recommend this, um, eight to 12 reps. So if you're living, lifting eight to 12 reps in the weight room, the key is you wanna be failing or at least really struggling around 10 to 12 reps. So you don't wanna be able to just easily lift eight to 12 reps and then call it a day. You want to be really pushing the weight. And so you're gonna do that times three. Or, or up to six, right? Three to six sets right here. Um, and these are reps. If you're a beginner, I don't recommend going this hard. If you're just starting from baseline, so uh, like the question, if you know, you're know you a beginner, how can you start so that you're not sore? Just general strength training. So you can put together a body weight workout, uh, three sets, let's go body weight here. Especially if you're not, because we can't go to the weight room right now, if you just put together a general uh, workout of uh, three by 10, right? And then you do squats, three by 10, push-ups, you get the idea. So just a general workout because, let me show you guys this actually. This is a chart of how strength training develops you uh, from a physiological perspective. And so, as you can see, what I just talked about was hypertrophy training. That doesn't actually kick in for a few weeks when your muscles actually start to grow. All of your strength gains right away are mostly from this neural adaptation. And so when you start out as a beginner, you don't need to do a whole lot because you're getting huge gains from not doing very, very much at all. As you get uh, more advanced with your lifting, you need to do a lot more stimulus in order to make the same gains or to continue improving. So. That's why we would move over to this hypertrophy phase where you're pushing more weight. Um, so that'll just help increase your overall strength gains, hypertrophy gains, and neural adaptation. But hypertrophy isn't focused on neural adaptation. Let's go back here. Hypertrophy is kind of focused on doing muscle damage. So if you damage your muscle, break it down, it is gonna grow back stronger. And so once you get through with this base stuff, you can move over to some more intense lifting here. And this generally requires you to go in the weight room. Uh, not all the time, right? If you're at home and you can find ways to 
get the get an adequate amount of weight to where you can only do eight to twelve reps, then you will be doing hypertrophy training. So, if we're trying to make a workout on this or based on this, I highly recommend doing full body movements or compound lifts. Let's go right here, and this goes for pretty much all of your lifts, not just hypertrophy. But one of the things, if you're doing compound lifts, which means you're moving two joints or more, so if we think about squats, it's actually moving three joints because your ankle joint is moving, and this goes for lunges too. Your ankle joint is moving, your knees are moving, and your hips are moving. And so when you're doing compound lifts, you're actually increasing your testosterone and your, and your HGH and all the good hormones for you to start putting on muscle mass. And with motocross or something like that, you don't necessarily need to stay super light. I mean, there is some element of lightness, but this isn't cycling or running where you have to actually carry your weight. You have an engine carrying your weight. So if you have more muscle mass, I think that's pretty much only going to benefit you. Um, now, you know, if you're a huge, uh, like a bodybuilder, that's definitely going to impact your ability to ride. But if you're doing this endurance training, endurance training actually helps keep your muscle fibers smaller um, because the smaller your muscle fiber is, the more oxygen, or the more efficient it is with oxygen, and so endurance training actually makes your muscle fibers slightly smaller. So not a reason to avoid endurance, but definitely a reason to do both of these so you kind of fight that effect of decreasing muscle size with endurance. Although, you know, most people don't have to worry about that too much at all. So you want to do compound lifts. So like I said, big motions, right? So we get those hormones to help us out. So if I was going to make a workout for this, Let's, let's get a new sheet of paper here. All right, so we're doing hypertrophy training. Let me just write that here. And again, we're doing this partially to build muscle mass, but mostly just to build overall structural integrity because on a bike, you're taking a lot of forces, right? If you land wrong, that's a lot of forces on your joints, on your bones, on your muscles, and they need to be fairly robust and able to absorb those so you don't get injured. Uh, so this is kind of base training and injury prevention a little bit. So you're going to slowly build up. Obviously, don't jump right in the weight room and do 10 to 12 reps, super heavy. You know, start with 15 reps if you're in the weight room and then work your way down to 8 to 12. And what you want to do when you're setting up a strength program is you want to start with your more complex lifts. So squats. Uh, maybe deadlifts and these these heavy ones with large muscle groups because they're going to take the most energy and if you're doing these last one you're not going to be motivated two you're going to be tired and not get as much out of it so you want to do these types of lifts right away in your workout um, and then yeah you want to be pushing the weight quite a lot when you are doing these types of lifts these heavy compound full body movements you want to make sure you're using good form. So you want to think about your core being structurally sound. This goes for strength training as well. Uh, if you're, you want to protect your spine is what you want to think about. So when you're doing squats, you're doing deadlifts, you don't want your, your spine to be curving at all. You need it to stay in the same location because if you're, if you're going down and then your butt's rounding out at the bottom, let's say when you're doing your squat, right, and that butt's rounding down, that's going to be adding a lot of torque on your spine and your spine is not designed to have a lot of torque. So before you jump super seriously into heavy squats, deadlifts, lunges, you want to slowly develop your form. And uh, that takes quite a while. One of the things that I like to do to have my core engaged is dead bugs, where I put a plate in my hand and then I raise it over my head. Or well, I'm laying on the ground and um, I raise the plate this way. And then, well, I'm not raising it, I'm moving it laterally. And then I put my legs out and I try and keep my back flat along the ground. That just teaches you to keep a tight and straight spine. So uh, just be aware of that. You don't want to injure yourself lifting super heavy if you're not prepared for that. Watch some other videos for squat form because that's very important. Same with your deadlifts. Uh, following this, I would do some type of upper body. Uh, bench is kind of the clear one. Uh, you can do dumbbell bench. I think you should do a combination of dumbbell bench plus normal bench because when you're riding, you're going to have variable loads moving from either side. And dumbbell bench can sometimes help you stabilize a little bit. Uh, when I was a cross-country runner for stabilization, we would do one-arm dumbbell bench and just kind of resist that force. So that might be something to do to try to like teach your body how to resist forces moving, you know, 
from one side to the other. So bench, dumbbell bench, um, you know, you can do incline bench. There's a million different ways to do this. So that would be my next lift, something with that upper body because that's your second major muscle group. Um, if we are going to, we need, we, we need to make sure that we're balanced. So you might want to pair that with some pull-ups or some, or some uh, cable rows, something for your back dumbbell rows. I mean, if we're thinking about motocross and some young, it's really a full body exercise, especially don't forget these legs here. Oh, I didn't mean to cross those out. Don't forget the legs there because you're standing a lot of the times and you need to support that weight. Um, I'm going to actually show you guys how I just create these nice and easy. This sheet that we created uh, for class here, I like to just kind of scroll down this. So uh, you could, you know, we got squats. Um, you could do some more legs. So let's, let's say you want to get your glutes. You could do some hip bridges right here. And again, these are going to be um, eight to twelve, eight to twelve reps, and then three to six sets. When I say three to six sets, I would start down with three sets, and then as you get more comfortable, maybe move up to four sets, and then maybe move up to six sets. Um, okay, so we, we got we got glutes, hamstrings, we got squats, which are gonna or deadlifts. Those are gonna attack all the leg muscles. We got your pecs, we got your upper back, lower back. We don't want to neglect lower back. Lots of people forget this area. Hip bridges can kind of get that, but at home I like to do supermans. If you're in your you know bedroom, um, if you do have a gym, I really like back extensions. Actually, I hate them, but I think they're a really good motion for you. So I would I would do those back extensions for that lower back. You know, if you have the correct machine, abdominals. Um, you know, you can do regular sit-ups at home. I like these things called pole vault abs, so you might not be able to do them right now. Um, and I just named them pole vault abs. Basically what you do is you hold on to a pull-up bar, and then you raise your knees up to your chest, and then you kick your feet towards the ceiling. And that seems to help. Um, well, it seems to be a difficult ab exercise where you can only do 8 to 10, and uh, you get a really good workout, So um, rather than just doing 30, 30 sit-ups. So if we keep scrolling here, obliques might be pretty important for your training. So you might not be able to do all the muscle groups on one day. And so what I recommend is you have one day hitting some muscle groups and then other days hitting all the rest. So you might have a large muscle group day and then a smaller muscle group day. But let's just go over some of these. Uh, windshield wipers for obliques. Um, I'll just call them wind wipers here. Basically, you're going to lay down. Uh, and then you're just going to rotate your legs back and forth. Let me, let me close this out so you can actually see me. So you're just going to lay on your back and then legs up in the air. You can bend your knees to start and then you're just going to windshield washer those all the way down to the ground. That's going to really pull on those obliques. It's probably the best oblique exercise that I've been able to find. Um, let's go back here. So in my opinion, you know, you don't need to do uh, every single muscle group, like I said, I would throw in some calves here as well. And that's a really, that's a long workout. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you're doing three sets, eight to 12 of those, that's a pretty solid workout there. And then you can throw in an arm day or something like that to show off your shoulders, your biceps, because you are going to need that strength um, on that side of things. So uh, let's see. How does this? Okay, so I'm gonna to get to those questions later. Um, but I am gonna address the arm pump right now. So with arm pump, what's happening is, let's go back here. So with arm pump, what's happening is that you're getting, your muscles are almost cramping up there, right? And so if we think about it, I get arm pump when I'm, uh, when I'm climbing because I'm always using my, my grip strength. And so you're doing the same thing. So as far as training goes, you're gonna to wanna to do lifts that work your grip strength uh, because this is gonna reduce your fatigue while you're riding. Um, now it's not gonna be perfect because when you're riding it's gonna be way more intense than when you're just lifting. So I would really work on your forearms as well. You can have a forearm day or whatever, you know, not a whole day on them. But I would spend time working on your forearms because 
what's happening is you're pumping, well, there's a few things. You're getting lots of blood to that area because that area is working hard, so it's demanding oxygen. And so we have increased blood flow. But when it's like, when that muscle's like rock solid, it's not just full of blood, it's also slightly cramping. And it's not, it's, it's not like a grabbing cramp in your traditional sense, but when the muscle is fatigued and out of energy, energy or ATP actually releases that muscle from being uh, cramped up a little bit. And so you wanna learn how to fight cramps. And the way you do that is, well, one, increasing your strength because cramping is typically a, fatigue, or a sign of fatigue. And so when you do get that muscle pump and it's just really bad, uh, it's just that your forearms are fatigued. So getting those as strong as possible is gonna help. Um, another thing, if you do get that cramp, uh, if you're just riding normally and you're not racing or anything, then you can take some time, uh, but you can stretch, stretch it out, so pull them back like that. Stretching helps release cramps. It's one of the most effective ways to release a cramp, so you can do that. Uh, interestingly enough, they actually found that pickle juice helps reduce cramps. They used to think that was through water or electrolytes, which a lot of people think to reduce cramps you need to drink more water. That's typically not the case. If you were dehydrated and going into cramping, you'd be having full body cramps. So a lot of it is just that fatigue. So, um, however, with the pickle juice, they found that there might be a neural reflex in the back of your throat. And if you take a shot of pickle juice or something vinegary and salty like that, it can actually reduce your cramp time. And the studies are really interesting with that. What they do is they make people do calf raises until they cramp, and then they'll stretch the calf or they'll take a shot of pickle juice or whatever. So uh, yeah, when you're using those little muscle groups, they tend to cramp up on us. And so just increasing the strength overall and then stretching them periodically if you can. And maybe while you're riding, you might be able to stretch that out a little bit. A massage is also a stretch, so kind of rubbing that out a little bit uh, may help. But yeah, it's just the thing that is probably always going to happen, but you can probably reduce the severity of it. So, um, oh yeah, okay, so... Let me address this question, Kalina just, well, let me address Carly and Kalina's question. So how does this training compare, schedule compare with other sports? So any explosive power sport, this is gonna be pretty comparable because we're just trying to increase overall body strength. We're not, we're not uh, prioritizing endurance or anything. So this will be comparable to a lot of sports. The grip strength is fairly specific. Um, for Kalina's question, is a hypertrophy workout effective for a regular workout routine or should it just be used when training for a specific sport or goal? I'm a fan of hypertrophy training for almost everybody because the more muscle mass you have, the better off you're going to be in general. So, oh, and then how much pickle juice should you drink? Uh, I don't know. I don't actually remember the amount. It was just a shot, I believe. It's just a neural reflex. So personally, I think pickle juice is nasty, so I'm not going to be drinking that. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, if you like it, you can drink a cup. Um, but in my opinion, when you're out there riding, it's not going to be very effective. So I would just try and find a way to stretch those out a little bit if you can. And just try to not hold on so tightly. So if you can find like some type of grip configuration where you're not squeezing the bar and try to practice riding relaxed. Oh, so that's actually a good tip. If you're squeezing the bar really hard, which you're going to have to do, but if you can find times to ease up on that, on that grip so that you're not just, you know, fully using your maximal strength to hold on to the handles, uh, that'll also reduce this this uh, muscle pump there. So, okay, so that's kind of how hypertrophy training works. Um, again, eight to twelve reps. We, if we look over here, this was kind of during your off season, so you're developing a good base, right? If you can be lifting heavy, like where you can only lift ten sets, and you're doing that six times, you're going to be doing pretty well. Uh, some other tips for this hypertrophy training is to take short rest. So this, in my opinion, is my least form of training. So if you take 20 to 30 seconds rest between these lifts, you're not gonna allow your muscle fiber to recover, and then you're gonna do even more damage. So uh, typically when you're lifting this weight, you're gonna have to decrease that weight overall, but I think that's a good thing to do because you're still getting the benefit of increasing your muscle strength. So try to get rest short. So what I would do, instead of going from squats to bench to pull-ups to hip bridges, I would do I would do maybe four times 10 on squats with a 30 second rest. 
So this is a super brutal, super brutal workout. Um, I hate it, but you know, you don't need to start lifting super heavy with this. You know, you can do 15 reps if you want. There's no magic number really. I mean, this number kind of works fairly well, but you can get still really good gains doing 15, but that short rest is going to be really good. And then something else you can do is you can compound set them. So let's say you're doing those squats and you really want to work on your glutes so then you compound set that with hip bridges hip bridges and so what you would do is you do your round of squats and you lift you know for your 12 reps or whatever and then you take 20 seconds of rest only and then you go straight into hip bridges maybe do 15 of those or if you're lifting lots of weight you know with a plate or something you can do 12 or 10 and then with only 20 seconds in between, you go back to squats, go back to hip bridges, go back to squats, go back to hip bridges. What you're doing there is you're just maximally doing damage to the area, which then is going to increase your hypertrophy. So you don't want to overdo it because you still need to be able to move around. And if you train too hard and destroy yourself too much, it's actually not beneficial for you. So before you do some training like this, you really need to work up to it. And in order to work up to it, I would just do those squats, take a rest, squats, take a rest, squats, take a rest and so on. And you can start with three sets of that, work up to six, depending on how intense you get. Some people might uh, get crazy and actually um, start doing 10 sets, but that's, that's for like bodybuilding, so I wouldn't recommend that. Okay, so that's your hypertrophy training. That's kind of how you can maximize that. As you move throughout your season, and now maybe it's your peak riding time, you want to start moving strength in. And I would start moving strength elements into this workout already. So if we're looking at some strength workouts here, and again, this is increasing your maximum strength. So the most amount of weight you can move, kind of like a one rep max. You can test your one rep max if you want. Uh, you know, I don't think it's necessary, so I'm not gonna talk about that too much here. But if you do have questions on that, ask them and I'll answer those on Friday. Um, or you can ask them in the chat if you are interested. Um, so. Okay, I'm going to answer those questions in a little bit. Um, so with strength training, what you're doing is you are only doing, well, you're lifting heavy enough to where you can only lift like three, I mean down to one, but we're going to say for this three to six reps. So if you're doing bench press, you're lifting heavy enough to where you can only do five or six reps, and then you are out of juice kind of. So a, a way that you can implement hypertrophy and strength if you're trying to cross this bridge here, you can do two sets of six, fairly heavy. Let's say you're doing a deadlift here, right? And there's a million ways to do a deadlift. Just make sure that your back is flat and you're, you know, uh, pulling your shoulder blades back. You're engaging your core because you don't want to be uh, injuring your back with these. And then once you did those heavy ones and you're a little bit fatigued, you can do some hypertrophy stuff and fatigue yourself a little more. So maybe then you do uh, three sets of 12, for let's say front squat since the weight is a little light, less. All right, so this is a good transition because you're doing some heavy stuff, starting to develop that strength, and then you're still hitting that hypertrophy range there. And then you could do the same for, for uh, bench here. We could do bench uh, heavy, right? So two by, let's say five reps. And then you could follow that up with just some push-ups, right? push-ups three by 15. So what you're doing is when you're fresh, you're gonna lift heavy, and then when you're tired, you're just gonna kind of grind out and do some muscle damage to build those muscles up. Um, and then down the line, right? So as you get to the smaller muscle groups, like biceps and shoulders and calves, it's really hard to be able to lift super heavy and, uh, or heavy appropriately, right? Because you're gonna have to lift so much weight for your calves to only be doing six reps and be fully fatigued. So when you get down to those, I would kind of resort back to this hypertrophy training if you can, and you'll have plenty of it. Uh, just, you know, you're still working your squats when you're doing deadlifts and squats too a little bit. So, or you're still working your calves when you're doing squats a little bit. So I think you can get, a, get away with that. And then just at the end of your workout again to, you know, I would, I would plan around these main lifts here, and then I would go over here and then just make sure you're showing up your weaknesses. Because if you have a weakness when you're riding, it's definitely going to be exposed. So uh, once you get into real strength training, you know, well, real strength training, you're, you're going to be doing more sets here. So you might be doing, 
um, maybe four to six sets of again three to six reps and uh, when you're doing this type of lifting you want to take long rest so the point is you want to be able to move as much power oh let me let me bring this down here you want to be moving as much weight as possible and so you're going to need to take extra rest so that you can do that because otherwise you're kind of in no man's land and when you're doing this you want to be lifting really heavy so so when I'm doing this type of training I'll take maybe two to five minutes between the lifts depending on how heavy I'm lifting sometimes what I do so I'm not really just standing around is I'll do some heavy deadlift and then while I'm waiting I might just go do some shoulders or something. So that's not ideal, but I don't like to spend two hours in the weight room. But if you're doing real long strength sessions, you might have to spend, you know, hour and a half in the weight room if you're taking that long rest with doing all those sets and those reps. So this is pretty intense. You need to make sure you have a spotter with you when you're doing this type of lifts. And you want to make sure you're lifting correctly as well because it can be quite, you know, dangerous if you're not doing it appropriately. Some of the tips that I have real quick is a closed grip. So when you're doing bench press, or anything where a bar is above you, you want to make sure that your thumb is closed around that bar. You don't want to have an open grip like that because that bar can fall off, you're lifting lots of weight, that's not going to be a good time if that dumbbell or that barbell comes down on your neck, right? So something like that. Uh, make sure you have a closed grip and then make sure you have a spotter when you're lifting this way. And so look up how to correctly spot. Uh, you want to make sure you're with somebody who knows what they're doing when you're doing this because otherwise, you know, you could injure yourself. So this is kind of, you know, you can go into a really heavy strength phase, but what I like to do, and again, when we're looking at this, is as you're moving through this competition phase and you're moving into this peak phase, we want to start prioritizing power. And so again, power is strength times speed. Let me get a new sheet here. So power equals strength times speed and so we've been working on that strength right and that hypertrophy is durability and now we're trying to implement speed in my opinion you should have speed implemented in your training plan throughout because power is going to be one of your most important things on a bike so there are a different bunch of different ways to introduce speed one way is plyometrics plyometrics so these are going to be box jumps you know and if you're doing this stuff um, motocross stuff you definitely want to be doing some explosive type movements so box jumps even if you're in that hypertrophy phase you can do a one day maybe or maybe even two where you're doing some box jumps uh, lunge jumps I'll let you look up some more of these uh, but you can do rocky push-ups you get the idea things that are explosive so you're trying to move as quickly as possible and you don't need a lot of weight for these so I'm not a fan of wearing a weight vest for box jumps I'm sure there's a time and place for it but I think just learning how to release quickly off the ground is a good start. Same with lunge jumps, Rockies. You're just trying to be as explosive as possible. Another way to implement power is just trying to be explosive in your lifts. So when you are doing a lift and you're, let's say you're going down on bench, you want to try and fire up quickly. So that's going to help train this speed element there. And what you're really doing again is training that neuromuscular system. So if we go back to this chart here, let me do it this way. If we go back to this chart here, again, um, our strength is going to develop slowly over time. So hypertrophy takes a while to build up and then we get fairly, you know, it gets there around, I mean, there's no definite time on this, but hypertrophy peaks around, well, they're saying, based on this chart, probably nine months if I had to guess. Um, Obviously, you can find more gains later, but your neural adaptation or that strength phase, that's going to be where you're training for this power, right? Because you're getting that strength high so you can utilize that speed and create some actual power there. Okay, so just explosive movements in general when you're just lifting, that would be a good thing to practice. And then three, um, Olympic weightlifting. So this is going to be your most power lifts so we have we have the snatch and the clean you can call it the clean and jerk if you want 
these are going to be most beneficial for almost every sport out there, to be honest, because power is your most usable thing. And especially for motocross, these are full body, and you're kind of, for like, say, the clean and jerk, you're, you're pulling up here, and then you're going up. That's going to be a very similar motion to when you're on a bike. So if you're really trying to get uh, to maximize your riding capability, I think you need to be doing Olympic training. So it's quite um, intense and it is quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. So again, really good form and uh, you just want to slowly develop that over time. So you can lift light weights when you're doing this right away because you're again working that speed element rather than that weight element. And so what I would do is when you're doing your hypertrophy phase, so early in the season, you just want to add like a little bit of power. So just doing some lunge jumps, some box jumps. You get the idea. Uh, when you're in that strength phase, what I would start doing is I would start combining uh, a heavy lift with a, an explosive movement. So let's say you're doing back squats here. And then following those back squats, take a little bit of a rest and then pair back squats with some broad jumps. So back squats, let's say you're doing uh, four by 10, fairly heavy, right? Oh, four by 10, I didn't mean that. I meant four by six, so fairly heavy there. And then follow that up by broad jumps. Broad jumps are just both feet on the ground and then you're exploding and jumping as far as you can and as quick as you can. And let's just say you go four by two broad jumps. So one of the things that happens, oh, it's called post-activation muscle potentiation. That's not correct, but it's something like that. If you're lifting super heavy, what you're doing is you're hyping up your neural system, your electrical system that fires your muscles. And immediately after lifting something heavy like that, you're actually more explosive. And so that's why you would pair this heavy lift with a broad jump following it, because then you're, you're just training that neural system a little bit more and you're just getting a little bit more heightened. And so you can do the same kind of stuff with, uh, with push-ups, or well, let's say you do some bench here. You know, four by six reps, and then you could do some rocky push-ups. You know, and maybe just four by three because you're just working on some speed. You don't need to overdo it too much right there. So that's kind of how I would move from strength start transitioning into that power because you still want to stay on that strength because again power is strength times speed so this is kind of kind of a power workout now of course you don't want to neglect your shoulders your back your abs your calves you want to make sure you're adding all of these in so when I'm making these workouts I think I've said this before but get your main large muscle groups get the strength get the power there and then round it up with some abs with some lower back Oh, we also need upper back to uh, even out all those that bench we're doing, so maybe some pull-ups. And then hit some calves. And then on another day, maybe on a rest day, you could work on that grip strength, right? So some, some cord roll-ups or just some dumbbell curls, whatever you gotta do there. Uh, you can even do grip strength stuff, like climbers have those hand grips like that. Um, so that, that's kind of how you can do that. And then let's, let's talk about power real quick here. So when you're really getting into a power phase, and maybe this is, let's call this championship season. So this is where you want to start backing off on your volume here. So we had your volume, you're doing heavy lifts, lots of volume, you're starting to ramp up that power and that strength, that intensity, right? And then now when you get into maybe this championship season, this season probably shouldn't be so long, maybe right there, this is where you want to start backing off on a lot of the work you're doing. So not lifting as heavy, right? Or maybe not doing as much. So we were doing six sets of strength. Now let's say you're only doing two by six, or maybe even less. Let's say two by four for your deadlift, let's say. So that's two sets here, only four reps. And then you're going to do maybe some box jumps and you're going to do more box jumps this time. So now you're going to do a set of four by six or eight, right? Box jumps. So what you're doing here is you're starting to prioritize speed 
and deprioritize strength. You still want to stay on some strength so that you don't lose that strength. You still want to maintain it. But now, because we're decreasing volume, that's going to help you recover more and help you be more explosive when you're actually competing. So that's when you're going to start making the shift over to strength and, or to speed. And you want to do that again for all your lifts. So same with, let's say, bench. And then maybe rocky push-ups, four by six. And then you can change that up, mix and match a million different ways. Um, yeah, let's, let's talk real quick about core stability and then I'll get to some of your questions. So when you're thinking about core stability, a lot of people think about just doing sit-ups, but that is not quite how you want to conceptualize it. So core stability, think about everything between your shoulders and your knees because all of this is tying in at some point to your hips. Let's just think about your quads for a second. Your quads go from your knee and then attach up into your hip, right? Same with your hamstrings. Your glutes are kind of going from your lower back down into your leg muscles there. Uh, and then if we think up here as well, your shoulders are kind of pulling and holding your arms in place. You have all these, you know, rib muscles, you got the back muscles. So you want the most robust core you can have, especially when you're on like an unstable surface and trying to manipulate a large machine. So these heavy lifts, uh, squat, deadlift, bench, these are really good for getting core activation. So when you're actually doing your bench lift, you're activating your ab muscles, you're activating your back muscles, and you want to train yourself to do that. Same with your squat and deadlift when you're keeping that spine straight. You want to be activating all those muscles so that, well, one, you're training them and you're teaching yourself to be able to maintain a stable, stable situation. Uh, some of the lifts that I like to do to kind of practice the stability a little bit, um, and I guess it's not the only kind you can do, but I'm a big fan of these landmine lifts. So if you take a barbell, say right here, and this can really work well if you don't have really heavy dumbbells. So this is your barbell here. Let's say for shoulders, you wanna do some landmine lifts. You can have a person right here. Let's see if I can draw anything decent. And so this is just one hand here. And what you do is you find a wall or a corner, put the end of the barbell down into that wall, add a plate here, and then you're able to lift kind of like this. And so when you're doing this type of exercise, you want to make sure that your core is staying straight and then you're lifting the barbell down and then you're pushing it up. So you can do that with dumbbell press, but the barbell seems to work really well for this. You can also also do this with rows. If you have a, a bench right here. So you would have the barbell with a plate. Oh, that didn't, I didn't draw that correctly, but you get the idea. Maybe you have a few plates on there, right? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna put your hand on the bench there, go back, standing on the ground, drop your other arm, grab it there, and then you're gonna be pulling that way up. So this is some rows, and it's also helping you resist. You can do this with the dumbbell as well. It's helping you resist that twist. So you wanna keep a strong, stable core all the way down. You can do one more type where you have the barbell into the ground, you have it here, and then you're rotating down trying to maintain that core stability because what you're training yourself to do here is you're training yourself to resist rotation. So when you're riding and you hit something that rotates you, you want your muscles to be trained to handle that twist. And so if you do single arm or single side stuff where you're trying to resist and maintain that pull, that's going to really help you when you're actually uh, on the bike. I should draw ahead here. So that's going to actually help you when you're on the bike. So I really like this type of lifting for core stability, doing those heavy things as well to get that core stability in. So that's a, that's a pretty good overview. Uh, let me answer your questions. Ask any more if you have. Um, again, you want to maintain that endurance a little bit too. So doing some HIIT training, going out for you know a 10-minute warm-up and then 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy, 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy, that's going to help your heart be able to handle the intensity, especially if you're riding at an intense level. So all right, on to questions. Okay, so I, I talked about that arm pump. Um, let's see. I answered those. All right. How can you tell when you're training too hard? Great question. So one of the things, especially when you're lifting hard, that can happen is your small muscles and your connectors. So when you're doing bench, let's say, your pecs are doing a lot of the work. 
but you have all these little shoulder connectors and everything, and those can get pretty tired. So if you start getting a little bit of pain or a little bit of tiredness in there, some weakness, or maybe you can't quite lift as much, you might need to cycle out of that and do some easier training uh, or just take some days off. So actually, I should, I should do that for you guys. Sorry, this video is running a little long. But, uh, well, before I change mind here, so yeah, so one is to think about those little muscles and make sure that those are maintaining their integrity and their strength. Um, and if they're getting weak, take an extra day off, get some extra sleep, uh, lift a little heavier, or maybe switch to cardio and take a week off from strength, whatever you got to do, because your strength gains somewhat maintain themselves. So just back off. You can have down cycles too, right, where you lift heavy for two weeks and then maybe you take a week of just body weight, just recovery. So as you get older, you're going to need more recovery there. Another way to measure recovery is actually your heart rate variability. Now, this might be a better recovery method for endurance athletes, but I think it would still apply pretty well. If you have an Apple Watch or a chest monitor or something, see if it looks at heart rate variability. And this is the ability of your vagus nerve, which is in your heart, to change and be responsive. Uh, so what happens is if you have low heart rate variability, that means that you're fatigued and your heart isn't responding as well as, sh as it should. If you have high heart rate variability, that means you're fresh and you're ready to go. So uh, that would be the number one way. Another way to measure if you're working too hard is to take your heart rate every morning before you wake or right when you wake up. If you see your heart rate jumps by some beats, uh, by like 10, 8 to 10 beats, that can be a sign of fatigue as well and that you either need more sleep or you need to back off on your exercise or you need to eat more all of the above right there's lots of ways to recover so eating more sleeping more working out less all right good question what percent of training should be done on the vehicle yes great question that's what i'm going to go into right now so that was kind of your physiology and so now we're going to talk about how you lay this out so in my opinion if you're training at a high level so this isn't base training let's, let's do a base training phase here so I assume you're going to enjoy riding anyway, so I think we should keep quite a bit of riding in your training. So let's say you want to ride particularly on the weekends, and I don't know how long people ride, but let's just say three hours here, three hours here, right? That's, that's quite a lot, uh, and you're probably going to be sore from that, so uh, that means maybe you should be taking Mondays off, right? Because if you're going hard on here, you need to take a little bit of a break. Uh, the reason is... Where's my red pen at? You have inflammation cycles. And so when you're riding for three hours a day, what's happening is your inflammation is peaking and inflammation tends to peak 24 hours out. So if we continue this over here, you know, you rode hard, inflammation peaks around here, but then you rode hard again. So now inflammation is peaking around here 24 hours out. And so you want some recovery days here. So if this was base training, then I might do a... Uh, a hit workout here with some with a followed by a hypertrophy lift so you're doing endurance and strength that day and what's gonna happen is let's say you're doing this workout midday your inflammation is gonna start falling and then you're gonna hit this workout and you're gonna spike it again and so what I like to do is kind of back-to-back -back days so then I would do maybe just a hypertrophy training day there and your inflammation is going to continue to go up. And then you want to take another recovery day. So maybe just easy cardio, whatever you're trying to do. And then this starts to come back down. Obviously, my inflammation cycles don't line up because I kind of messed up there. And then you'll go back up. So maybe you want to do another hypertrophy day there. So this these cycles look messed up, but what you just want to think about is you want to go easy some days and you want to have um, hard days because when you train hard, then you want to recover well from that. That's going to be how you're maximizing it. This is your base training phase, so you don't need to be having super heavy days. You want to kind of just develop some easier workout. Again, low intensity, higher volume. You just want to get your body ready to actually work pretty hard. Let's say you're starting to transition out of this phase and you're going into a strength phase and I should say you can ride here too maybe one hour here you know um, you want to still be able to enjoy your workout especially in your base phase you could be riding four days a week right uh, maybe maybe instead of doing your hit work if you're actually breathing hard from riding that can replace your hit work I'm not exactly sure how 
hard people ride or how people feel on that. So if you're moving on into like, let's say your strength phase, how I would configure that is I would have a strength day here, followed by a hit and maybe a hypertrophy day, and then a rest day. Well, you can ride on your rest day. Maybe you're going to ride one hour for your rest day there because your riding shouldn't be as intense as your strength days, right? And this can be power as well, a little element of power there. Let's say you're going to ride for one hour for your recovery day. Take it completely off from the weight room, right? And then Friday, you hit another strength day here. Maybe you don't go as hard a little bit because you just rode. You know, you can figure out what you need. Maybe some power there. And then... Let's say you ride again. So we got three strength days. That's pretty good so far. And then let's say you do a short hit training and a short ride. So maybe for Saturday you went for a three-hour ride, and then you just went for another hour ride there. And then on Monday, maybe just take an off day, right? So something like that. So I would, you know, I think you can ride three or more times a week, but you're gonna to have to determine if you can ride and work on the strength at the same time because I'm not exactly sure how you guys feel after you know a ride, if you're pretty beat up. That's why I think you should probably do lots of rides here so that you get yourself used to it. That can be some like specific training there uh, for your base phase. And then when you get to your power, you probably wanna ride a little bit less. That's probably debatable, but really when you're hitting that strength, you wanna be, you wanna be resting more. And then let's say you get to that peak phase. So let's say it's competition time. Now you're gonna to wanna to ramp your riding back up in my opinion and decrease your volume on these workout days. So let's just say decrease volume and you're doing power. That looks weird, so strength. And you're just, you're just decreasing the overall intensity there. And maybe you can go for a ride this day. I would, I would try and go and ride after strength training. So I would do this first and then I would follow it with a ride. Um, for however long, one hour, two hours, right? And then maybe a light day here, like really light, maybe some light hits, and then just power. So just some box jumps, whatever you're doing, right? And then maybe Thursday, you just focus only on riding. So this is a, you know, a focus day where you're really trying to ride fast, hard, and well. Friday, you hit the power again, a heavy power, heavy strength day, but again, just lowering the overall volume so that you're not too fatigued. So you're prioritizing power here with a little bit of strength. This, this is the workout that I'm kind of referring to here. We are maybe only doing two sets of strength and then, uh, oh, that's not it. Where did it go? Right here. Here we go. Where you're only doing, uh, where did that go? Here it is. All right. Where you're only doing two sets of strength work, two sets of strength work, and then a lot more box jumps. And this will allow you to ride more. So you could ride this day as well. And then maybe take Saturday off here, ride Sunday, and then uh, maybe even ride Monday, right? You're still getting three days of lifting in. Uh, with that power because you're lowering your volume if we look back to this When you're really starting to ramp up you're lowering that overall work, but you're increasing the intensity of that so more riding more power Less strength less hypertrophy if that kind of makes sense So uh, any final questions? That's kind of how I would set this up. Of course. I'm not an expert on riding So you're gonna have to fill this in but ask any questions. I'm gonna stick around for a few more minutes and Okay, we do have some questions, so I'm gonna answer those. Uh, what are the intervals to qualify for HIT training? Two minutes on, seven hard, one minute easy. Okay, let's look at HIT training real quick again. Grab another sheet of paper here. So with HIT training, yeah, really anything qualifies as long as you're spiking your heart rate. So to start with HIT training, I like 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy because you're not doing too much and you're, you're at a high intensity, so a nine out of 10 when you're going hard there. Uh, you can even go a minute easy, 30 seconds might not be enough, something like that. 
you can work this up to 20 if you really want. That would be pretty intense. So, or a minute, right? Hard, easy. If you're going to uh, do the two minutes, you need to be able to focus for two minutes, but it's, it's pretty good. I would just decrease this intensity. So maybe work up to a minute next, right? And then a minute easy. And you can do four by that and then slowly build that up. Two minutes. So you want to think about how much overall work you're doing. So here you're doing four minutes of work. That's hard, right? Four men. Here you're only doing three men of hard work. Here you're doing uh, 10 minutes of hard work. With your idea of seven times two minutes, you could do only one minute easy. Typically, it depends how hard you're going. If you're going at a seven out of 10 here for this uh, hard session, then you might not need as much recovery. Uh, you can vary this recovery if you want. Maybe you do the first half one minute rest and then you work up to an eight out of 10 for your last two sets, let's say. And then for your last two sets equals a two minute rest so that you can recover. So the higher the intensity, the more recovery you need. The lower the intensity, the less recovery you need. So yeah, this would qualify. Two minutes is quite intense right away, but eventually, yeah, you could work up into that. I would say for HIIT training, you could work up for endurance athletes up to five minutes of high intensity at like a eight plus out of 10. So, all right. So I hope that helps. It looks like we are done with questions. So I'm gonna end this stream. Thanks for watching. If you do have any more questions, you can ask on the anonymous questions on Blackboard and I will answer those on Friday.